Hey guys, Pastor Justin Simmons here from Life Source Church, Perry Hall. I have a message for you today that God has given me that I believe will bring encouragement, refreshing, revelation, and hope to your life and your journey of faith in Christ Jesus. Go ahead and get yourself ready for what God has to share with you through His Holy Word and let your heart be opened, ready to receive what God has for you today. I'm truly believing God's best for you and all that is yours. But before we move into the message, go ahead and hit that thumbs up icon below the video to let us know that you enjoyed today's message. Also, smash that subscribe button and turn on the notifications to stay up to date with all our sermons and other resources provided on our YouTube channel. And if you like this message and think it could impact a friend or family member, hit that share button. I'll meet you back here at the conclusion of the message where I would like us to pray together, come into agreement for your prayer needs. God bless you. this topic today and I'm going to ask if you can can you just stand back up to your feet if you've got the strength the ability come on how many of you know you can do all things through Christ who gives you the strength amen and I and I want you to go ahead at this time I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of John chapter 1 John chapter 1 we're going to bounce around to another scripture in a moment. If you put your finger, if you have your physical Bible, you can put your finger in John chapter 1 and also try to maybe squeeze another finger into the book of Colossians chapter 3. We're going to open up reading a, a couple passages in a couple of different books here. John chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 3. If you have your phone, you can get that out and go open up to those scriptures as well. Some of y'all are trying to say, Lord, I need a bookmark right now in Jesus' name. John chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the beginning, help me out, church, was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, hallelujah, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now go ahead and skip over to Colossians chapter 3. I got to get there quick. I should have put a bookmark in my Bible. Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to go to verse 16, and it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That sounds good to me. Dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And today, I want to talk to you and preach a message just simply called The Word. Because, you know, in light of it being the Christmas season, I felt that it was probably appropriate to preach a little bit about Jesus. Is that okay with you today? And I want to preach about Jesus being what the Apostle John called him in John chapter 1, known as the Word. So, Father God, I thank you that the Word became flesh and dwelled among men. I thank you that the word changes not. And I thank you for this word today. And I pray, O oh Lord, that from this pulpit today that your words would be spoken because it is your words that are able to set every person captive to free sin. It is not the words of man. It is not the words of the flesh, but it is the words of the Spirit of God that are able to 
deliver and set those captive to sin free from sin. And we thank you for your word today. I pray let the words of my mouth and the meditation on my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And we thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray and all the saints of God said amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. I love the book of John, and a lot of times when you hear of somebody that gets saved and they're looking for a good starting place to read in the Bible, a lot of people will say, a lot of people have different opinions, but a lot of people will say to go to the Gospel of John, because the Gospel of John, when what John wrote, the purpose of his writing was to prove conclusively that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that through Jesus, we may have eternal life. How many of you believe that Jesus is the way and the only way to eternal life? It doesn't matter what anybody else would have to say. That A lot of times in this hour, you hear people that say, well, there's different ways to God. There's different directions to God. I'm here to say and agree with the Apostle John with what he wrote, that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, and no man will ever come to the Father but by Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what anybody else has to say, but the Word of God says that Jesus is the way and and John's writing was to prove conclusively without any doubt that Jesus was the son of God he is the son of God and that through him we may have eternal life i'm thankful to god that through jesus christ today that i have eternal life i'm on this world but i'm just passing by i'm just passing by and i'm thankful to god that through him I, through son jesus christ i have eternal life and John's writing in the whole book of John, John says in, in the first chapter of the book of John, he writes that he came to bear witness of Jesus Christ. And the way that the Apostle John opens up his writing of witness to Jesus was to write, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what John does is he does a powerful thing here, and he takes this phrase, the Word, and he personifies it to make Jesus known as the Word. And let me tell you something, church. He didn't just choose this phrase, the Word, by coincidence. How many of you know that in the Word of God, there's no such thing as coincidences? That everything that is written in the Word of God, every specific word that is mentioned in the word of God is mentioned for a specific reason and a specific cause. We do not serve a God of coincidence, but we serve a God who says, this is my word, so live by my word. Amen? And when John writes and calls Jesus the word, there is a specific reason for this. In the Greek, we know that this word, word, if you caught what I just said there a moment, uh, just now, that what it is in the Greek, it is the word logos, which just means word. And it also translates to this, it's a, to something said, including the thought. It can also mean an account, a cause. It can mean a word uttered by a living voice. But this use of the term the word was a term used by theologians and philosophers of the time. It was a word and a phrase that was used in the Jewish community as well as the Greek community, a, a very used heavily by theologians and philosophers. For the Jews, when they would hear the word, the phrase, the word, it was an agent of change, an agent of creation. Because in the, in the book of Psalms, chapter 33, it says that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Anybody know the scripture? 
and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. That phrase, the word, was an agent of creation. That phrase, the word, is also a source of God's message to his chosen people through prophetic utterance and unction, which is why we have the writings of the Old Testament prophets such as Isaiah and Jeremiah and so on. The phrase, the word, was also to bring about a standard of holiness and righteousness through God's written law. To the Greeks, though, the Gentiles, the phrase, the word, was something used heavily in philosophical writings. It was to delineate the principle of reason that governed the world. They would use the phrase, the word, it was considered a thought still in the mind. So when John writes and he personifies this phrase, the word, he pers- he's taking something that has a great value of meaning to the Greek community and to the Jewish community. And what he says is, is that Jesus Christ is the word and the word was in the beginning. And let me tell you something, what he was also trying to show to the Jewish people, he was trying to show that Jesus is the agent of creation. I'm here to tell, I'm here to preach to somebody this morning. If you don't believe that he's the agent of creation, I'm going to tell you why he is the agent of creation. Because when Jesus comes into your life and he changes you from the inside out, the Bible says that if anybody be in Christ, he is a new create. What is it? He is a new creation. Behold, the old things have passed, and behold, all things have made new. Jesus is the agent of creation. John was trying to say that the prophetic writings of the Old Testament prophets, do you know that when you read the Old Testament church, that everything points back to Jesus? Everything. Well, pastor, I don't see Jesus mentioned in the Word. Well, I would tell you that you need to get into the Word and to study the Word. You can read the prophet Isaiah's writings. You can go all the way back to the the book of Genesis and read about Melchizedek. And I'm here to tell somebody today that Jesus is all throughout the Word of God. As a matter of fact, that this Word is about a covenant between Jesus and his people. This word is a marriage contract. Oh, I'm going to hear to preach to somebody today. This word is a marriage contract between you and Jesus Christ. The whole word of God is all about Jesus. Let me move on. The phrase, the word was significant in these cultures. And he, John, he used this word the word. Jesus is, he's it. He's all of it. He's all you need. Jesus is the principle of reason for the world. Why? Because the Bible says that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And how many of you are you thankful that the word became flesh and dwelt among us? Let me move on. The word logos used in John chapter 1 was also used in this passage in for in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. And I want to provide some context because I want to talk about the word today. I want to talk about the word. How many of you genuinely love God's word? How many of you cannot go a day without getting into his word? Tell the truth and shame the devil. I I I cannot go a day without opening up my word. Sometimes I might read a little bit. Sometimes I might read a whole, whole lot. But I'm thankful to God that I've got such a hunger and a desire for the word of God. But let me give some context to what's going on in the book of Colossians. In the book of Colossians, it was a, this book was a series of, it was a series of letters with other books in the Bible. Paul is writing letters from a prison in Rome. And Colossians is a letter written to the believers in the city of Colossae. Colossae was a city in Asia Minor. If you actually look at a map of where Colossae was, it was located not too far south from a city that many of us know from the Word of God is Laodicea. Laodicea is one of the churches that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Let me just give you a little bit of a background about what the Bible says about the church of Laodicea that Jesus says to the church of Laodicea. He says that you are neither hot nor cold, but since you're lukewarm, I'm going 
going to what? Spew you out of your mouth. Does that ring a bell to somebody? It was in that region where there was lukewarmness. And actually, if you go into the end of the book of Colossians, you can see where Paul entices and tells the people of Colossae to take this word that I'm writing to the church of Colossae and pass it on to the church of Laodicea. Why? Because there was lukewarmness in the land. Can I go on further? Paul has major influence in the church of Colossae. Why? Because the founders of the church of Colossae had been converted through Paul's missionary travels. He had spiritual authority over the church of Colossae. But the interesting thing is, is that Paul never goes to Colossae. He never goes to the church. He writes this letter, though. But although Paul has never been to Colossae, he becomes of something that is of serious concern. And what it is, is he becomes aware of false teachings that begin circulating throughout the church of Colossae. These false teachers were spreading heresy throughout the Colossae church that ultimately would lead people to deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God in the flesh. And Paul has to write this letter of, that we call the book of Colossians. He has to write this letter as a word of rebuttal against these false teachings, saying that everything that you need in this world, Church of Colossae, and he's telling us today, everything that you need in this world is found in and through Jesus Christ. Everything that you need. I'm here to tell somebody today, you're looking for things in all the wrong places. You're looking for happiness through your job and through your career. You're looking through for joy through your significant other. But let me tell you what, you'll never find those things through those methods. But let me tell you what, there is one that will sit closer to you than a brother, than a father, than a mother, than a friend. And his name is Jesus Christ and he is all that you need in this world. He's all that you need. So Paul's writing this letter to the church of Colossae, correcting some false teaching. Because, and, I, and there's a very powerful, this is a powerful book, and the whole Bible, as we know, is powerful. But this is a powerful book because in Colossians chapter 1, you read where Paul is writing about the supremacy of Jesus. How many of you know we used to sing an old song, Can't Nobody Do Me Like Jesus. Anybody remember that? Because he's my friend, hallelujah. But Jesus, Paul writes that Jesus is supreme over all. He goes on the right in Colossians chapter 1 that Jesus is the image of, a, he's the, he's a, uh, the image of God, of an invisible God. He goes on. To establish his supremacy, he goes on to say that Jesus is the exact representation of God and that the nature of God is revealed through Jesus. How many of you are thankful that Jesus came, that, that God came, let me, let me back up a moment, that God came to this earth in the form of a man? Are you thankful for that? Because this is what's powerful, that the Son of God came as the Son of Man so that the sons of man could be made sons of God. Did you get that? That the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of man could be made the sons of God. What am I talking about? I'm talking about us in this room that have been saved and redeemed by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. That the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of man could be made sons of God. You are a son and a daughter of God if you are saved and born again. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. You're a son of God. If you've got a female next to you, you say, neighbor, you're a daughter of God. I'm here to tell you that you are redeemed, that you are his chosen people, and that he loved you so much that he sent Jesus Christ to this earth to die and pay a ransom for your sin. Let me move on, because I want to talk a little bit about what was going on in Colossae. The problem that was going on in Colossae started out with what is known as syncretism, 
What is syncretism? Syncretism is when other philosophies and other religions are combined with Christian truth. Syncretism, when other philosophies and other religions are combined with Christian truth. And what this led to in the church of Colossae was a form of spiritual relativism. What do I mean when I say spiritual relativism? Spiritual relativism is the belief that you can find and define your own spiritual well-being. Somebody start the car right now because I'm about to, here we go. Spiritual relativism, the belief that you can find and define your own spiritual well-being, that there is no absolute truth, but only the truths that a particular individual or culture happened to believe. This is what was happening. In other words, a person who believes in relativism believes that people can have different views about what is moral and what is immoral. Does it sound like to you that the things that were going on in the city of Colossae and the church of Colossae are some of the things that we find are in parallel happening right now in this hour? Oh, I'm here to preach to somebody today. Because there were these heretical teachings going on in Colossae. And there's a lot of teaching. Let me, tell, let me tell you, you've got to be careful who you listen to these days. You've got to be careful who you tune into and you listen to. We've got preachers that are out there right now. I've just seen all kinds. 2022 has been some interesting, crazy stuff that's just kind of come to light. I've seen some preachers that have come out and they're like, well, I don't know about that tithing thing anymore. I'm not calling any specific names out, but they're, I don't know about that tithing thing anymore. Because it's not written in the law. No, Abraham did it before it was even, uh, it was a requirement. He did it before there was a law. Let me move on. Spiritual relativism infiltrating the church of Colossae. All this heretical teaching that was going on. It's going on even in this hour where there's a lot of people that are being deceived because this is what Paul writes to to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, there's coming a time. I'm here to say the time is right here. There's coming a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because why? Because they have itching ears They will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now, I see a lot of this. What is going on? Do you know that there's nothing new under the sun? Do you know that things that were going on, you know, the the apostles had their hands full as well, just as much as we have our hands full in this day and hour. Because right now, like I said a moment ago, there's a lot of false teaching and a lot of false preaching out there. You've got to be very careful. And let me tell the young adults in this church that you, that a lot of, I see a lot of young adults that they're tuning in to specific people that are preaching the word of God and they, and and they're drawn to them because they dress with a nice, cool, style. They've got a whole bunch of lights. They've got a whole bunch of nice fancy stuff that looks good in the flesh. But you have got to know the Word of God so that you can parse truth from a lie. And the reason why I wanted to preach this today is because it grieves my heart so much that there is such a lack of knowledge of what the Word of God says in the body of Christ. Do you know what? You want to know why people? I, I'm going to say this right now. There's a, the reason why you see a lot of people that are in churches that they've been saved for 30 years, but they still walk into the house of God acting like that they're bound and that they're struggling with this and with that is because they don't know the promises of the Word of God to know how to stand on the Word of God. Do you know that you've been called to be be the head and not the tail? 
Do you know that you are more than a conqueror? Can I go on? That you have victory through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. But you've got to know the word of God to stand on so that when you face face adversity and you face trial and tribulation, that you can look that circumstance in the eye and and you can proclaim the word of God. I'm here to tell you today that how many, I'm, I'm going to say this. I want you to receive this today. Do you know that you can be in the valley and still walk in victory? Do you know that you can be in a storm of trouble, but you can still square your shoulders back and say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And let me tell you something, church. The reason why we've got a lot of people that are being deceived in this hour is because they have not done what Paul compels the church of Colossae to do, and that is to let the word of Christ dwell in them richly. I'm here to tell somebody today, I'm here to tell this generation that says there's no, I've heard young people, there's no absolute truth. Is this absolute truth for somebody? This is the truth that sets the captive free. Let me move on here. Got lost in my notes. Lord, help me. In Jesus' name. You've got to know the word of God. We've got to study this word out. Day in and day out. And we've got to live by this word. You know, God is not looking for you to go. And here's the thing is, you've got a lot of people that, Lord, help me, that are going, hopping the churches because they're looking for the pastor, to preach a message that will accept and condone their lifestyle. Does that sound like freedom to somebody? It doesn't sound like freedom. To say, we've got pastors that are okay with with couples that are not married that are living together and are sleeping together. Do you know that fornication and sexual immorality, that that creates separation between you and God? Do you know that the Bible, can I go a step further? The Bible says that we shouldn't even give the appearance of evil. Does it say it? So we've got to, but we've got to know what this word says. Because here's the thing is, God's not, God is looking for a people who are not going to be pursuing happiness. You know, people will say, well, my sin makes me happy. It feels really good. God is not looking for a people that are happy. He's looking for a people that are holy. He's looking for a people that will live according to holiness and righteousness and a lifestyle of holiness and righteousness. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul gives an outline of the character of the born-again person. He lays out a bunch of different characteristics in Colossians chapter 3. He says, you know, the character of Christ, the new man, kindness, humility, love, and so on. But he ends with saying that you've got to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That word dwell in the Greek is the word enochio. I didn't say Pinocchio. I said enochio which means to inhabit. It is derived from the Greek word oikio, which means to occupy a house. In other words, to remain. And what Paul admonishes the Colossi believers is to let the word of God inhabit them, remain in them. Do you know something? i got to speak to this. Do you know, have you ever heard... Somebody say troubling words like this, like, I just had a revelation from God. Anybody ever heard those words before? Do you know that we've got false religions that start because somebody say, well, I had a revelation of God. I had a revelation. But I think, and I, and, or they say, well, I, heard, I, I got a prophetic word that the Holy Spirit gave me. But let me tell you what, he will never deviate from this word. 
He will never deviate from this word. And as a matter of fact, I believe that is the Apostle Peter who writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, I believe, where he says that we have a more sure, <laughs> a more sure prophecy. What am I talking about? I'm talking about this word that we hold in our hands today. Do you know that this word is a prophetic word? Do you know that you don't need necessarily all the time somebody to say, I need a prophetic word, Pastor. I've had somebody come up to me. I need a word from the Lord. Let me give you a word from the Lord. Right here is the word from the Lord. They're looking for somebody to say, I need, I need a prophetic word. Can you give me a word? I need a word. I just want to go ahead and say, how about you pick up your Bible for once? We have a more sure word of prophecy that is in our hand. The Bible says this. Peter said this. He said, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by the act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. What does that mean, Pastor? What that means is, is that although man wrote the words on paper, that they had the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ was speaking through their mouths, was speaking through pen, and that the word of God says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scriptures, Scripture is God breathed. This is out of the mouth of God. I want somebody to get this today. I need a word, Pastor. I need a word from God. You're holding a word that has been breathed right out of his. I want to put my mic down and just listen to the preacher for just a moment, okay? I want you to get this. I'm going to keep saying it till you get it. You don't always need a prophetic word. Praise God for the gift of prophecy. Paul says, hey, I speak in tongues, and I speak in tongues more than any of you, but I desire that you would prophesy. We have to desire the spiritual gift of prophecy according to the word of God, but you've got a more sure prophecy right here in this word, and you're holding the very words of the living God right in your hand. Why would we not want to open it up when you have the opportunity to hear out of his mouth? on a day-to-day -day basis. Getting fired up about it because we've got people that sit in churches for 30 years and they don't know their word. And they're easily swept up and deceived. I've seen over the last few years a lot of believers swept up in deception. Lord, help me right now to not step in it, get in trouble. But he says, I want this word to inhabit you richly. That word richly in the Greek, I'm teaching a little bit today some Greek, okay? Is that okay with you? He's, that word richly in the Greek translates to the word plusios, which means, I love this, richly means abundantly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you abundantly. Let me ask you something. How can you let the word of God dwell in you abundantly when you don't ever open it? How can you let the word of God dwell, reside, remain in you abundantly if it sits on the bookshelf for 5, 10, 15 years and has picked up more dust than a Swiffer? How? I want, to say, I want this word just like what Paul says. Let the word of Christ. Let me tell you what. Christ is not his name, by the way. Jesus is his name. Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah. Let me, he's, Paul is writing, let the words of the anointed one remain in you in abundance. He is an abundant God. The word says that he will do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. I want this word to live in me abundantly overflowing in me and this is why this is why I've announced recently that as a church I want 
us to do a one-year Bible reading together. Has anybody ever done a one-year Bible reading? I'm doing it right now, and I'm excited to start it back over. And on January 1st, well, that seems like a lot of right, a lot of reading, Pastor. Let me tell you what, you'll spend more time on, there's a lot of people that spend more time on Facebook and TikTok and on Netflix and on Hulu and on Disney Plus and all that sort of stuff, and they say, I don't have time. And what you've got to do, let me tell you something. For those that have done a one-year Bible reading or read your Bible every day, help me out a little bit because I know you're going to agree with me. Don't you have to discipline yourself to say, I'm going to put down my phone. I'm going to put down the remote. I'm going to mute my phone because I don't want to hear from anybody but Jesus right now in this moment. You've got to discipline yourself. Oh, let me keep going here a little bit further since I'm in in a mess right now. Okay, let me tell you what. Some people will say, well, pastor, you're sounding very, very legalistic. Let me tell you what. You're you're saying I'm being legalistic, but let me tell you what. You're trying to use legalism as a form uh, to excuse your laziness. Well, pastor, I don't really need you to give me a Bible reading plan because I am so spiritual that I don't need to read the Bible every day. I don't need a Bible reading plan because I've read the Bible 20 times. That sounds very legalistic of you, Pastor, to give us a plan. No, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get people free by the word of God because it is the truth that will set you free. I said it's the truth that will set you free. I'm going to say it again because somebody's not giving me an amen on it, that it is the truth that will set you free. It's this word of truth that will set you free. If you're struggling, you're in pain, and you're in bondage, it is this word that will set you free. But you've got to discipline yourself. Get away from all the social media. When we go into a fast, some people need to fast maybe social media because you're addicted to it. Some people need to fast the news. Because you're so consumed in the Fox or Newsmax or CNN, whatever it is. You're, you're so consumed in the news and you say, well, I don't have time to know the Word of God. I don't have time to read the Word of God. How about turn off Fox News, turn off the news, and get into the good news of Jesus Christ. That will, del- that will bring deliverance and salvation to your soul. Abundantly, I want this Word abundant on the inside of me. Let me go ahead and move on to the next point here. I'm holding in my hand. They're out in the foyer. They're also on our LSPH app. This is the one-year Bible reading plan, and what I'm going to be doing is, is I'm going to be, it might be a little bit of a different plan than maybe some of you have done before, but it's called the one-year chronological Bible because how many of you know that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the way that the books are laid out, it is not laid out in a direct timeline? Do you know that? You would know that if you read the Word. That when you get to the prophets of old, when you read about Isaiah and you read about Jeremiah and Lamentations and Ezekiel and all these things, that what they're writing and, and everything, that it parallels to things and events that are going on in the book of First Kings, Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. You would know that if you would read your word, right? And so we're ha- introducing this one-year chronological reading plan. And my heart, this desire, I want to encourage you to get on board with reading this. The, the plan is out in the Connect Center. It is on our LSPH app because I want... In 2023, let me tell you something. I want to see people in the church, in the body of Christ, that are walking and living in a perpetual state of freedom and victory. And you might say, well, pastor, you don't know what I've been going through. Oh, let me tell you something. I've been through some things. I might be younger. I might be only 40 years old. But I've been through some things. But let me tell you what. I've gone through these things never alone. That my anchor in the storm has always been Jesus Christ and his word. He is the word. Hallelujah. And I'm, it, it grieves me that people can't live, been in church so long, can't walk and live, live in victory. And it's like the Eeyore spirit. You know who Eeyore is, right? 
He's that donkey with the tail that's nailed. I don't know how that worked out. And Winnie the Pooh. You know, always, oh, bother. Now, sometimes, this ain't even my, my message, but sometimes, you know how you come into church and, brother, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. And a lot of times they put on a mask. Do you know that it is okay to not be okay? I said it's okay to not be okay. It is not okay to stay that way. It is okay. Could be why? Because even Jesus went through a moment of anguish right before he was taken and arrested and led to be crucified. The Bible says he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was sweating. He was sweating blood. He was, he was in so much anguish and he cries out and he says, Father, you spare this cup from me, but nevertheless, if you don't spare this cup, not my will, but your will be done. I feel like we got to have that mentality at times. Satan's greatest weapon. This is a quote from A.W. Tozer. Satan's greatest weapon is man's ignorance of God's word. I think that's a powerful statement. Satan's greatest weapon is man's ignorance of God's word. Why? Because think about it. Jesus was tempted just as we are tempted. Do you remember? When Jesus... Before he starts his ministry, he goes into the wilderness, and we know the story that Satan tempts him three times. Do you know what's very interesting about that story is this? I'm going to make this point that Jesus twice, that he rebukes the devil with the word of God. But do you notice that the third time that he rebukes the devil, that he did not whip out a scripture this is good for somebody. Somebody's going to get set free today because of what I'm about to say. That the third time that Jesus rebuked the devil, he did not use a scripture. He used the authority that he had. And the authority that he had ties back to his knowledge of the word, of the word uh, and, 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 and proclaiming the word of God in his re first two rebukes to the devil. Because let me tell you something. When you know the word of God, you will have the authority over every power of darkness, every voice of hell that comes against you, every attack of the devil. Let me tell you what. When you know the word of God, you can stand in front of hell itself and proclaim the word promise of the word of God with supernatural spiritual authority in your mouth. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. It gives us this outline. Know the word, but know that it is my word and by my spirit that gives you authority to trample on serpents. It gives you authority to lay hands on the sick and see them heal. It gives you authority to cast out demons and devils. There's a measure of authority that comes from the knowledge of the Word of God. But again, Satan's greatest weapon is man's ignorance of God's Word. Let me move on to this. I want you to open up your Bible to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 8 specifically. I hope this is a good word for somebody this morning. Luke chapter 8. There's something to, say, to grab about this story. When it comes to the word. Luke chapter 8. And I'm going to read a bunch of passages in here. So bear with me please. But I'm going to start at verse 4. It says one day. Jesus told a story in the form of a parable. Look at your neighbor and say parables. In the form of a parable to a large crowd. That had gathered from many towns to hear him. And he says this, a farmer went out to plant his seed. And as he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on and birds ate it. Other seed fell among rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. Still others 
seed fell on fertile soil, and this seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. And I want you to go down to verse 11 here. Jesus then explains the meaning of the parable. And what he says is, is he says that the seed is God's word. You see, on Sunday mornings, when you come to church and you hear the preacher preach, all the preacher is doing is just casting and throwing out seed to the folks that are in the church and those online. But goes, he goes on to verse 12. The seed that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while. Then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who what? Hear the word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. Now, this is what I want you to notice about this parable. By the way, something that is very a powerful principle for those that maybe don't read the Word. Hopefully, you're going to start reading the Word in January, and you're going to go all the way to December 31st of 2023. Is that one of the most powerful things about the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is that you can read the, very, you can read the same stories and the same accounts coming from multiple and different perspectives and get something different from each and every one of their perspectives. This same parable Jesus writes about in Matthew chapter 13, I believe. And you could go there and you can read that as well. I encourage you to read it along with Luke chapter 8. But the thing that is interesting about this parable that Jesus uses is that you notice that it is the soil that is different. The seed and the sower are not different. Are you catching that today? The sow the sower is the same. The seed that's being spread is the same. But it is the soils that are different. Now I'm going to talk to somebody today about this word, how, what the Holy Spirit showed me about it. Have you ever heard the term church hoppers? Have you ever, you ever known somebody that bounces around from one church after the next, after the next, after the next, and when you thought that they couldn't find another next, they found another next, and they're bouncing around from one church to the next and to the next, and let me tell you something, what they're doing is, is they're saying, well, that pastor didn't feed me. No, what the problem is not the, maybe the pastor, the problem is your soil. Lord, help me right now. The problem is, I know, and I know, like going back to what I was saying, there's some heretical teachers and pastors and people that are preaching a false doctrine. You've got to be careful. You've got to have discernment and you've got to have the knowledge of the Word of God. But there's some people that they will bounce around from a spirit filled Pentecostal Bible preaching church, go from one to the next, to the next, to the next, and not settle and not just get, and not get committed into the local church, not become accountable to a local pastor and they wonder why am I not growing it's because you've got some soil issues you need to work out let me go back up to the pulpit because I'm getting in trouble here everybody's getting quiet on me the soil is different and there's things I think that's I, I want to say this according to this parable if you ever want to know why am I not growing in the things of God, maybe you need to check your soil. The things that are in your life. Do you know? Oh, I, want, I want somebody to get this. Do you know that there is no ceiling that you can get up to when it comes to the power and the presence of God in your life? How do I know? Because I'm not, I haven't raised anybody from the dead yet. 
somebody's like, what are you talking about? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. The same power that rose Lazarus from the grave, rose Jesus from the grave, the Bible says, is in the inside of each and every one of us. And there's been stories. Have you ever heard of the preacher Smith Wigglesworth? I mentioned his name a couple weeks ago. There's an account and a story of him of him picking up a dead person and putting him up against the wall and telling him in the name of Jesus Christ, you shall live. Do you know what happened? The body fell over. Well, what did he do? He kept on doing it. Did it again. And again. And again. Until finally, after multiple tries of picking the person up, putting them, leaning them up against in the name, I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, the one that is the resurrection and the life, I command you by the name of Jesus Christ to get on your feet and live again. And, and lo and behold, the testimony is this, is that that person opened up their eyes and their lungs became full of air and they stood up on their feet and they had what was once dead was now alive don't tell me that you that that can't happen that i be, have you ever heard of stories of this happening it's even gone on in the modern age in other countries you ever heard the testimonies and the stories church I believe this. I believe that there is nothing impossible through Jesus Christ. That if you feel the Holy Spirit come upon you and you lay hands on the dead, that they can live again. Because he is the resurrection and the life. And my Savior lives, so now I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. I want to ask that you stand up to your feet. In closing, talking about this, I'm going to close out. I want to talk a little bit about the soil. The seed was the same. The seed is the word. The sower was the same. But the soil was different. Some people don't... Why can't I produce a supernatural spiritual harvest in my life? Because your soil is out of order. And you can only be four soils. I think that there's four soils in this room today. The first soil was the footpath soil, or the King James says the wayside. What are they? They this this the hearers that they hear the message. But the prince, the Bible, the parable Jesus says, but birds come down and they take the seed. You ever thrown like grass seed just out on the ground, exposed, and it never grows? Because it hasn't gotten in the soil. And what happens is Jesus says, birds come down and they take the soil. For those that hear the message, the prince and the power of the air, being the devil, comes and takes the seed away before it even has had the opportunity to go into the soil. That's the unbelievers. I would say it's not even just the unbelievers, but I would say it's even surface Christians. They think that they're saved, but they're not living. They're not living right. Let me move on. The rocky soil. These are hearers that hear the message and receive it. This is the believers that they hear the message. They come to church and they're like, Woo, hallelujah. I received that word. And they receive it. You ever, do you know what I'm talking about, church? You ever seen these type of people? They come to church. I received that word. Hallelujah. That excites me. That stirs up my soul. They receive the word with joy. But because they've got rocks in the soil that obstruct the ability for the roots to go down and go down deep, they end up dying and fading away. What am I talking about? I'm talking about those that got some rocks in your life. You got some stuff that is in the soil 
I, I don't know why I can't grow beyond where I'm at because maybe you've got a rock, you got some rocks that are restricting the ability for the roots to go down deep into the soil. I want you to evaluate for folks in, and, and, and be praying right now. Got some rocks that you've got to reevaluate in your life. You got thorny hearers of the word. What are they? They are the word people that hear. They receive. You come to church with joy. You come filled with the zeal of God. You got a fiery passion, but the carnal, worldly things choke the life and the harvest that could flourish in your life. These are the people that are caught up in the pleasures of life. These are the people that are caught up in the cares of life. You know that there is a lot of people, especially in the Christmas season that we're in, that are focused too much on the cares of life. But I want to, and, and they're worried how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to put food in the house? Some parents are struggling with the idea that you can't afford presents for your children this year. But let me tell you something. If he would, if he dresses the lilies, and if he watches over every sparrow, how much more does he love you? It if he watches over the sparrow, the birds, how much more does he love you? And we get caught up in the cares of life. And all the cares, the worry, the concern and everything, it chokes out the ability for a supernatural harvest to come into your life. Being caught up in the cares and the pleasures of this world. But the last thing, and this is the thing I want to give you hope today. The last soil is the good soil. The hearers of the word that hear the message, they receive it and they hold on to it. It remains in them. It does as Paul says that the words of Christ would dwell and remain in them richly. And the thing that is so amazing, and I love how the kingdom of God works. This parable, if you go read it, like I said earlier in Matthew chapter 13, the same parable ends where Jesus says that the harvest will return 30, 60, and 100. Did you catch that? Because this is powerful. Because in, in the world, in our world, we would th do the math and say, well, 30 times 2 is 60. 30 times 3 is what? Help me, math experts. 90. But Jesus doesn't say 90. He says, no, if, you've got, if your word remains, if your word remains in me, you got the good soil. It's going to produce a harvest 30 times, 60. He doesn't even say 90. He says 100 fold. That's how the kingdom of God works and the standard of the kingdom of God works. That he would say, no, it, it, it's not 90. It's the full 100. And I don't know about you, but I, I want to produce a supernatural harvest on the inside of me 30, 60, and 100 times fold like the word says. But your soil matters, church. And today what I want to compel you to do is it's time to get hungry for the Word of God. Some are already hungry. Stay hungry. 
because man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I live by what comes out of the word of God. But I want to compel the body today. As we're getting ready to go into a new year, January 1st, we're going to open up our Bible. And what I believe, and I want somebody to receive this today, I'm believing that people in this place are going to walk in a victory that you've never walked in before. Because you're going to grow in the Word of God. You're going to grow in the knowledge of the Word of God. Some people would say, well, what if I miss a day? That's okay. Get back on the horse and go ahead and keep reading and catch up and stay committed to getting into the Word of God. But you got to be dis- you got to discipline yourself and you've got to say, hey, I've got to make room and make time to hear from Jesus Christ. I've got to make time and put that. It's kind of like what I spoke about a month or so ago, that you can either choose to be a Martha and stay consumed with busyness or you can choose to be a Mary and sit down at his feet and say all I want to hear from you today is your word Jesus speak to me but you've got to make room in in your life for this church because you've got a sure a more sure prophecy right here raise your hand if you want to hear from God raise your hand up high if you want to hear from God You don't need a prophetic word all the time to hear from him. But you can hold it. Jamie, hold that. You can hold the word and open it and hear from him. Sister Darlene, hold that word. You can hold the word of God and open it and hear from God. I don't need to give it to Sister Sharon Burns. She's got the word all in her hand all the time, sister. I love, her. I love that woman. She's a mighty woman of God. But holding this word, and does it excite anybody that you, right now, you, some of you got it in your phone right now for free, that you can just flip through the pages and let God Almighty begin to speak to you. I promise this, that when you open up the Word and you study the Word, your life is going to change. You are going to get set free. I'm going to talk to somebody for just a moment longer. Stay with me, and I need some prayer folks just to be praying. When you read that Word, the Word will set you free. I said the word, Zachary. The word will set you free. When you open it up and you begin to study. Well, some people, have you, let me ask this. Have you ever opened up the word and you read a chapter or two and you didn't get anything right away? Have you? I have. But this is, well, this is what happens. That we get into this word. We read a chapter or two or three, whatever it is, and we're like, I didn't get anything out of that. And what happens is, is all of a sudden the Bible's closed, the Bible's put down, and it is forgotten about because you didn't get anything out of it. But what I want to compel you to do is what you do is, because the pastor also has moments at times, I open up the Word, and I'm like, oh, I already know that. Oh, I already know that. I didn't really get anything out of it. No, what you do is you don't put the Bible on the shelf and close it up. What you do is you say, I'm going to get back into that Word, and I'm going to read what I just read again and again and again until the Holy Spirit begins to speak speak to me through the power and the revelation of his word because his word is the bread of life for your soul and you discipline and you stay in the word and I promise you that when you are written that word you will grow in a measure of faith that you've never grown in before you will grow in a measure of victory like you never have before because there's power in the word of of the living God. It is right out of the mouth of God. And there is life in the word. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for the word of God. I love the word of God. God, help me, oh Lord, to never get lazy with your word. But my prayer over you today is this, that you would have a fresh hunger for the word. 
when we get into the new year, you've got a plan before you. Because this is what, the, what, why? Because I believe for 2023 to be a supernatural year of breakthrough and harvest is what I'm praying for. What do I mean? Not just for new souls and the harvest out in, around us, but I'm believing for harvest for you. Did you catch that? I'm believing for harvest and increase for you. That the work that is being done in your life that Jesus has done, he is going to complete it. Let me tell you what, the prom, the word of God, there's things in this word that have been fulfilled. The, there's some promises in this word that have been fulfilled. And there's some things that have not been fulfilled just quite yet. But by the time it's all said and done, this word will be fulfilled in its entirety, church. It will be fulfilled in its entirety. Hey, welcome back. I believe for someone who watched this message that the Lord spoke something to you that encouraged you, opened your eyes to something new, or even gave you hope for tomorrow. I'm so thankful to God that in this day and age that we're living in, that He's speaking. And His Word is a word of hope in not just times of difficulty, but in all times. The Bible says that His Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. That means that it's his word that lights up the darkness that may at times surround our path. It's the gospel message that provides illumination to get us to our heavenly destination. And it's his word that keeps us on the right heading and off the paths of darkness. And we thank God for the word today. I want us to come into agreement for your situation today. Maybe you're struggling with faith today. I pray this word builds up your faith in the Lord. Maybe you're lost and feeling hopeless. Just call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved and hope will be restored. Maybe you're in need of a miracle today. No matter what the circumstance is, we know that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. Let's pray together right now, Lord. There is someone watching that is in need of you right now, someone that is hurting, someone that is broken, someone that is in need for you to move in their circumstance and situation right now, Lord. And we call upon the God of the impossible, and we ask that you would release mountain-moving faith into those watching. And that situation that may look bleak, may look impossible, that you would do what only you can do. For we know that through God, all things are possible. I thank you that you're turning their situation around. And we thank you for the testimonies that will come forth of your goodness and faithfulness. And we pray that every testimony that will come forth will be used to show others just how good and faithful you are. We come into agreement on our prayers and petitions that we've laid before you. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. We love you. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram, and we'll see you next time. God bless.